and it is my pleasure to welcome you for today's webinar with Dr. Christopher Lee, who will be speaking with us about Exile and the Audio Imagi Imagination, the radio recordings of Alex Laguma from 1925 to 1985. We are glad that you are here. Before we get started, I want to say that the IU Institute for Advanced Study recognizes that Indiana University is built on the ancestral homelands and resources of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, Shawnee people. We acknowledge and honor these indigenous communities, both past and present. To learn more about increasing representation of and support for native and indigenous communities, I encourage you to look into Indigenous Indiana and the work of our First Nations Educational and Cultural Center. I will put a link to that in the chat, which I hope that all of you can see. Well, hmm. I'm going to add that there and then we'll work on getting that out to everybody because right now it looks like perhaps that's just going to the host and panelists. But I do encourage you to look up um, the Indigenous Indiana website. Today's format will be a presentation by Dr. Lee, followed by questions and answers. You will have an opportunity to put your questions and comments in the Q&A link that is hopefully visible to you at the bottom of your webinar screen, um, or you can put comments in chat if that works for you. And I will share those with our presenter. Uh, typically we'll hold those till the end, but if you do have a question or a comment about something that he is showing during the presentation that you need to ask right then, I will be monitoring that and I will let him know. This program will be recorded and available for later access. You are welcome to share it with others um, at that time, but we also want everyone to be aware that they are part of the recording right now, and um, although you're not visible, but this will be um, available and part of our archive for later. I also want to let you know about upcoming events. The next webinar in our Resilience and Memory in Archives, Libraries, and Museums series will be on Monday, November 15th, at 1 p.m., Dr. Carolyn Smith and Dr. Emily Burrow Rogers will be in conversation with me about weaving as cultural and environmental resilience. Registration is required for that webinar as all of our webinars. And we encourage you to visit our website so that you can find that link and register to join us. All are welcome. So at this time, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the program through which uh, Dr. Lee became a fellow of the Institute. We have a repository research fellowship that has been going on for several years now in partnership with several of the repositories here on the IU Bloomington campus. And when that was uh, instituted and, and underway, typically our fellows would come and be in residence for a period of a few weeks doing intensive research on a project that they had proposed in one or more of those institutions. But in light of COVID and the precautions needed for that and the disruptions that that caused, um, we tried an experiment this past year with having that be an, a virtual fellowship. So Dr. Lee is one of our inaugural virtual fellows for this. And so I think we'll get to hear a little bit about how that worked. But the Archives of Traditional Music and our colleague, uh, Dr. Alan Burdett, have been longtime partners of this program, and they were the host repository uh, for Dr. Lee. And so at this time, I am going to invite uh, Alan to come on and tell us a little bit about the Archives of Traditional Music and introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Suzanne. My name is Alan Burdett, and I'm director of the Archives of Traditional Music. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Christopher J. Lee, Associate Professor who teaches History and Africana Studies at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, who's worked with materials from the Archives of Traditional Music as part of his Institute for Advanced Studies Fellowship this year. Dr. Lee has devoted a significant portion of his professional output to the life and work of South African writer, activist, and intellectual Alex Laguma. The ATM was pleased to be able to provide Dr. Lee with access to recordings of Alex Laguma, which were part of the Dennis Durden collection and the Lee Nichols African Writers Collection here at ATM. These collections contain hundreds of recordings of radio plays, literary readings, and interviews with authors from the African continent during the 1960s and 1970s. The ATM holds 115,000 field, commercial, and broadcast recordings from around the world made between 1893 and the present. Dr. Lee's work helps amplify the ATM's mission to preserve and provide access to the work 
of diverse artistry from around the world. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Lee for his talk, Exile and the Audio Imagination, the radio recordings of Alex Laguma. Thank you very much, Alan. And thank you, Suzanne, for uh, hosting this webinar. And um, thanks as well to Elizabeth for uh, you know, helping coordinate things uh, behind the scenes. Can, is, is my audio okay? Can you? It's all good. Okay, I just want to make sure. Um, so uh, what I thought I would do today is, um, you know, follow up on what Suzanne was saying and, and, and also Alan and, and basically give a work in progress seminar um, on my work about Alex Laguma. And um, as I will show in the PowerPoint presentation, this has been a long-term process and, and in many ways, my, my research at the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana is sort of the final piece in this puzzle that I've been uh, putting together for myself. So I'm gonna uh, do a PowerPoint presentation which will provide images and um, a sense of the trajectory of my work um, and then and also some audio clips and then I'm, I'm open to questions after that. So um, give me just one second. So um, today I'll be uh, basically um, talking about, uh, as the title suggests, the radio recordings of Alex Laguma, um, but you know, particularly focusing on this theme that I've been developing for this project, which regards exile and the audio imagination. And uh, essentially what I mean by that are the ways in which um, Laguma, but also by extension, other African writers um, you know, engaged in a world of radio, engaged in a world of, of writing for radio. And I think um, this kind of audio imagination is something that's been uh, lost to scholars. And of course, there's some, there some scholars who have, who have worked on this, this kind of material, but at the same time, I think there's a lot more work to be done. And as Alan was indicating, um, there actually is a lot of material at Indiana um, I should say as well that, that part of this research project is also drawn upon work that I've done at the, the Schomburg Center uh, for, for Black Culture uh, in Harlem as part of the New York Public Library. So certainly there are uh, materials at, at other archives. Um, and just to say that, again, I think that these other genres of writing um, and these other genres of, of art, such as, as, such as radio plays, um, are our materials are areas that, that scholars should engage with. So hence this idea of the audio imagination. Um, I wanna play a clip that's basically an interview with Laguma that is from, is from the ATM uh, at Indiana. And I'll, I'll play this for a couple of minutes just so you give a, just so you can get a sense of who Laguma is um, I should also say very quickly that, you know, Laguma died in, in 1985. So, you know, he's somebody who was impossible for me to meet. So one of the magical things about listening to these recordings is actually listening to his voice and understanding him through his voice. And, and in fact, the first time I heard his voice, um, you know, was through these recordings. So there's something very powerful about that too. And, and, and hearing his voice is, is, is definitely a, a key element and, in connecting with him and, and again, the importance of, of these archival materials. So I'll, I'll play this for about two minutes or so. Alex Laguma, writer. <clears throat> in this program, written and narrated by Robert Serumaga, we look at the South African writer, Alex Laguma and his work. Well, I was born in Cape Town, an area known as District 6, that is a predominantly poor area inhabited by, well, if you call them people of the working class and of the Cape Colored community, that is uh, the designation given by the tradition, I suppose, and by the government of South Africa. And well, the early part of my life there inspired me to write first a few short stories and then finally a novel called The Walk in the Night, 
which was based on some of my experiences and some of the experiences of friends and other people whom I met during those years. Alex Laguma is the author of two novels, A Walk in the Night, published in 1962, and A Threefold Chord, and a number of short stories. Alex Laguma was born in 1925, the son of Jimmy Laguma, one of the outstanding leaders of the South African non-white liberation movement. And right up to today, Alex Laguma has been deeply involved in the causes that his father and his people fought for. The political humanist activities of his life led to his arrest in 1956 as one of the 156 men in the famous or infamous treason trials. After nearly five years of proceedings, the charges were thrown out by the courts. But later, Alex Laguma was rearrested and he spent months in jail reading and writing whenever he had the time. In 1962, Laguma was served with notice restricting him to his house for 24 hours a day. The only people permitted to visit him over the five years of restriction being his mother, his parents-in-law, a doctor and a lawyer. Alex Laguma wrote his first novel, A Walk in the Night, during this period. The title is inspired by a line in Shakespeare's Hamlet. I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain term to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature be burnt and purged away. A Walk in the Night was published by Mbari Publications, Nigeria in 1962. It is a banned book in South Africa. A great pity because A Walk in the Night is one of the greatest contributions to South African literature in particular and to literature in general in our time. It is a short novel, barely 90 pages long, but in it, the author achieves what many of his contemporaries are only still struggling after, a book about people in South Africa in their variegated particularities, their idiosyncrasies, and their private lives with apartheid as the framework within which they live these lives. Well, it's true, and I think that uh, it is inevitable that having to live in a society based upon racial discrimination and where people are sitting uh, virtually into compartments, black and white and colored, Indian, whatever the opinion they have uh, to express, inevitably becomes involved with the impact of this situation, color situation, on them. The difficulty, of course, is to try uh, to project oneself across the color line. And uh, I think uh, th that is where most uh, writers have failed or have met with uh, extreme difficulty. The problem is living in one set compartment, knowing only of your own life, and then trying to project yourself into the life or the environment of another party. Alex Laguma writes about people he knows. I'll stop there. Um, I hope that gives some sense of, of who Laguma is, his voice, and uh, his biography. Let me. Alex Laguma, writer. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. Um, I hope that gives some sense of, of who Laguma is and, and some of his concerns. And I should say quickly that that um, <clears throat> recording was made in October 1966, which is uh, the month after he left for exile. He left South Africa for exile in, in September of 1966. Um, he would remain in exile for the rest of his life. He died of a heart attack in Havana, Cuba um, in 1985. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about, about that more in a second, but just to you know, build upon some of the points that were made um, in that, that brief interview with Robert Saramaga, um, Alex Lagoon was from Cape Town. He was born there in 1925. He was um, specifically born in, in the District 6 neighborhood where um, his, his first novel, A Walk in the Night, is set. Um, but before I get to that, it's important to note that you know, he was very much a, a political writer and part of this is due to the fact that his father was uh, Jimmy Laguma, um, James Laguma, who was one of the founders of the South African Communist Party, um, which was established in 1921. And 
it should be said that that James Laguma had his own uh, uh, illustrious political career. Um, of particular note is the fact that he attended the 1927 League Against Imperialism meeting in, in Brussels, Belgium. Um, this meeting was important simply because it brought together a number of um, liberation struggle liberation struggles and their leaders to Brussels. And from that meeting, um, James Laguma went on to Moscow and met with Nikolai Bukharin, Soviet officials, and was a key figure then in helping establish a certain relationship between the Soviet Union and South African activists. And this is a particular history that, that Alex Laguma would become a part of as well. So James Laguma as a figure is important in terms of internationalizing the South African struggle. Um, and his son, Alex, would also be a part of that. <clears throat> so when we read Alex Laguma, there's very much a, a bent towards a Marxist worldview that is looking at class struggle. Um, but then also combined with that, a very strong anti-racism um, that we can also see in his fiction. Um, to get into to Alex's uh, political career um, and its, its interaction with his fiction, um, as the interview mentioned, uh, Alex was, was part of the, this, this period of, of activism during the 1950s. It should be said that uh, apartheid was established in 1948, and of course you had segregation and political racism prior to apartheid, that is prior to 1948, but it's really the, the period after 1948 that um, galvanized uh, that galvanized politics in South Africa and, and of course galvanized the, the anti-apartheid struggle. And so Alex Laguma was part of this generation that, that started to come of age during the 1950s. And this is the same generation that included Nelson Mandela, uh, Walter Sisulu, Oliver Tambo. So, so Laguma was very much a part of this, this, this political generation. He participated in the 1955 Congress of the People, which, which released the Freedom Charter, which was this founding statement for the African National Congress. Um, as to what its platform would be during the anti-apartheid years. As a consequence of that, Laguma was arrested with along, along with 156 other activists and was one of the accused during the, the treason trial that, that lasted for five years from 1956 to 61. And then, as I mentioned, he went into exile in 1966. And as the interview touches upon between 1961 and 66, uh, Alex experienced periods of house arrest, um, detainment, um, imprisonment in jail. So effectively, it was a period of extreme difficulty, um, a level of intolerability that eventually led him to, to leave in 1966. Having said that, um, interestingly enough, it was also a tremendously productive period for him. And he produced two novels um, during this period between 1961 and his departure for exile in 66. Um, these two novels were A Walk in the Night, his first novel published in 1962, um, and then his second novel and A Threefold Chord published in 1964. And he had also drafted um, The Stone Country, which would be published in 1967. Um, the year after he left for exile. Uh, the upshot is that, you know, his activism and his writing went hand in hand. Um, while he was under house arrest, this is when he, you know, you know, used fiction as a way of, of being political, as a way of um, expressing his beliefs. Um, but of course, it, it also continued once he went into exile. He published In the Fog of the Season's End in 1972 when he was living in London. And then he published his final novel, Time of the Butcher Bird, in 1979, a year after he had uh, arrived in Havana, Cuba, where he was the, the chief representative, the chief diplomat for the African National Congress for Cuba and, and the Caribbean. Um, his fiction, uh, you know, addressed apartheid era politics, particularly racism against, um, you know, people in South Africa and also the violence that went with it. Um, and it's important to, to think about how Laguma, you know, as a chronicler of the apartheid period was, um, you, know, you know, as an activist, he was very concerned about issues of um, uh, police violence, police brutality, um, the ways in which states um, interrupted, intervened in the private lives of people, 
Um, he was very interested in the experience of prison. Um, and all of this was based on personal experience. So again, his first novel to the left, A Walk in the Night, um, it's basically a story that takes place over a single night uh, in District 6, this, this multiracial neighborhood in, in Cape Town that was eventually demolished um, by the apartheid government after it was declared for whites only. Um, it involves a, 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 a police officer killing an innocent man so it's very much about the injustice of apartheid, the injustice of, of, of white racism. And, you know, this, of course, too, you know, the, the, you know, the theme of police brutality speaks to our own present as well, issues that we've been confronting in the United States. So it's, it's a story that continues to have relevance. His second novel is about um, shack dwellers in the Cape Flats. It's very much a family story. Um, you also have, uh, you know, the issue of the apartheid government, but it's also, you know, about how families come together to struggle against un unjust conditions. So um, it's it's also a story that 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 builds upon the themes of his first novel while also um, expanding his his reach and, and geography. Um, In the Fog of the Season's End, his third novel is about excuse me, it's his fourth novel. Um, I'm skipping over The Stone Country, which is about uh, prison life. Um, in the Fog of the Season's End is his fourth novel. It's about political activists in Cape Town. And Time of the Butcher Bird is, is about um, effectively uh, rural politics in South Africa. So yet again, Laguma is, is stretching his, his geography and his, his, um, his, his plots, but at the same time, sticking with themes of... of um, injustice under under the apartheid government. I should say quickly too, one of the reasons I wanted to show these covers is because um, um, as you can see to the upper right corner of these covers uh, published by the African Writers Series, which was edited by Chinua Achebe. Um, the African Writers Series is was the most prestigious post-colonial African uh, imprint. Um, and so Laguma was you know, quickly embraced by other African writers. And his work has since um, been seen as canonical. Um, this is touched upon in the interview, but it, it should be said that you know Laguma, um, you know he is he is a well-known figure in South African letters. Um, having said that, you know not all of his work and life is well known, and and um, this speaks to the to the research that I've been pursuing. And I should say that. My work at the Archives of Traditional Music is the third, is, is as I mentioned, the start, sort of the third piece in this puzzle that I've been um, working on. The first piece is uh, effectively a project I, I undertook, which was a republication um, as a critical annotated edition, um, Laguma's uh, memoir, A Soviet Journey. And um, this book came out in 2017. Uh, it was originally published in 1978 in Moscow um, by Progress Publishers. And when I first started reading Laguma, and this was around um, 2000, 2001, I was living in Cape Town then. Um, I had first gone to South Africa in 1995. Um, when I was living in Cape Town, you know, Laguma was seen as a writer that you should read to understand, uh, to understand Cape Town and its history. Um, so I started reading Laguma then, and yet there was this one book that sort of stood out that didn't fit with his novels, and it's this memoir, A Soviet Journey. And A Soviet Journey, you know, it struck me as kind of strange, you know, this, you know, Laguma, I think this book about the Soviet Union. Um, but then, you know, as I, you know, you know, got older and, you know, started to piece together Laguma's life, it made perfect sense. Um, again, Laguma being the son of James Laguma, who had traveled to the Soviet Union, member of the Communist Party. So it made perfect sense that the Soviet Union also figured largely within Laguma's political imagination. So what's important about a Soviet journey is that it's, it's, it's a travel memoir, but it's also autobiographical. It's a personal history as to why um, the Soviet Union figured large within his family. Um, and by extension, <clears throat> through his description, through his travel um, descriptions, uh, Laguma is making also very much a political argument, suggesting the ways in which the Soviet Union was able to develop 
um, that socialism provided a model of development um, that could apply to South Africa. So even though on the surface it's a travel memoir, um, Laguma is making all sorts of arguments within the text about how um, you know, uh, socialism and how Leninism in particular provided a way of, of having urban areas um, develop rural areas, um, you know, making certain, you know, economic transitions from, you know, a kind of feudalism in rural areas to, to, to socialism. Um, it's a complicated book, and it's, it's, it's also unique insofar that it's one of the longest accounts of the Soviet Union by an African writer. So this is the first project um, that, again, came out in 2017. What's particularly interesting to me is how Laguma spends a lot of time in Central Asia, um, this, this area of the world that, that um, doesn't figure largely into understandings of anti-apartheid politics, but actually has a fairly interesting history with regards to Black Atlantic politics. And um, just to digress a little, uh, Langston Hughes, the African-American poet, um, went to Soviet Central Asia during the 1930s. So, so you, know, you know, roughly 30 to 40 years before Laguma, but nonetheless, um, Soviet Central Asia was a place that, that different black intellectuals, writers and thinkers visited upon invitation of the Soviet Union. So Langston Hughes visited there. Um, Paul Robeson and Du Bois um, also went to the Soviet Union. So even though a Soviet journey on the surface appears eccentric, actually Laguma fits into this, this, this deeper history of black Atlantic politics in relation to the Soviet Union. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the Soviet Union for Laguma, you know, represented potentially a future South Africa. Um, on the other hand, you know, with the, the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and, and all the, you know, issues revealed with regards to the Gulag, and, and some of this was coming out too during the 1970s, I should say, so during the time Laguma was writing, um, it is important to, you know, also be critical of Laguma. He definitely idealized the Soviet Union. Um, he definitely took an orthodox Soviet view. Um, and there's room for, criti for critiquing that, um, for sure. Um, nonetheless, I still think it's important to, to think about how, you know, for some activists, the Soviet Union was um, this model. And it's important to understand that um, historically. I should say quickly, the picture to the right is, is Laguma, obviously in Red Square, and, and the woman to, the, to, to his left is his wife, Blanche Laguma, who was also a member of the, the South African Communist Party. So the second book, um, the second piece in the puzzle that I've been working on, and in fact, it, it should be out, um, I hope by the end of this year, possibly in January, is this book called Culture and Liberation, Exile Writings, 1966 to 1985. Um, this is not a republication. It's a completely new book. Um, it's effectively collecting all his, uh, or I shouldn't say all, but as, 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 as much of his writing as I could collect um, from his period in exile, again, from 66 to 1985, we're talking about pieces of journalism, literary criticism, book reviews, um, some short stories, um, effectively, you know, writing that he published in journals um, during his time in exile. Much of this writing hasn't been collected before. And I should say the, the book, once it's published, is estimated to be about 624 pages. So we're talking about a very big book, a lot of writing that hasn't been collected before. And even though scholars have known about this work, this is the first time that, that um, this book, that, excuse me, that this work will be more widely available. So this has very much been a passion project for me the past um, several years. And it's, it's been in production for a, about the past 12 to 18 months, COVID uh, delayed some of the process. But to, to get, to just offer a brief synopsis about this book, I mean, one of the things that I'm very interested in Laguma is, um, you know, similar to a Soviet journey, you know, stepping beyond his fiction and getting into how he wrote so much nonfiction, not just the memoir of Soviet journey, but also just small pieces, you know, short pieces for different journals, such as Lotus, um, such as Sachaba, which was a journal of the African National Congress, 
um, the journal The African Communist, which was published by the South African Communist Party. Um, also journals like Presence African, uh, journals like uh, The Black Scholar, um, Tricontinental, published in Cuba. Um, so he wrote for a number of journals worldwide. And, you know, connected to this is my interest in, in, in writers as activist intellectuals, um, but also as, as political intermediaries. You know, these, you know, Laguma lived in London, which connected him to activists in, in, in other parts of, of Europe, but he also traveled to the Soviet Union, which connected him to um, Soviet authorities. He traveled to the Middle East, he traveled to Dar es Salaam, he traveled to India. Uh, North Vietnam, and, you know, ended up in Cuba. So he was very much an intermediary for the ANC, this diplomat, um, writer, intellectual who, you know, connected worlds. And I'm very interested in, in how, um, you know, the agency of individuals like Laguma enabled that, you know, constituting political geographies um, and helping constitute and, and, and sustain um, different radical traditions around the world. Um, during the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Um, the other thing about this project, too, very briefly, is that I'm interested in the notion of the archive and how um, a figure like Laguma, with his travels, um, his instability, um, left a very you know, thin personal archive in terms of personal papers. And so one of the ways I see, the, see this book is, is a way of putting together an archive. That is to say, I see this collection of writings as not just an edited volume, but I see it as a kind of archive in and of itself. So um, even though Laguma didn't write a, an autobiography, um, I see this book as a kind of provisional autobiography that tracks his movements, tracks his beliefs, um, tracks the kind of writing life he had over this uh, nearly two decade period. Um, just to give a sense of some of the materials that are included, he, he was in, very involved with the Afro-Asian Writers Association. And these, these are images from the journal Lotus Afro-Asian Writings that, that Laguma contributed to, but he also helped edited the, edit the journal. He was also the, the second secretary general of the association beginning in the, the late 1970s. And really after Laguma's death, I should say that the organization itself was, was started in the late 1950s, first with a meeting in Tashkent um, in, in Soviet Uzbekistan. And um, really after Laguma's, so you had one secretary general from that period of the late 70s, then Laguma took, uh, took over the leadership. And really after Laguma's death, the organization went into decline. So. It's just to say that Laguma was a crucial figure in the Afro-Asian Writers Association and this belief of, you know, creating an Afro-Asian literature that wasn't just, you know, about Africa, wasn't just about Asia, but, you know, sort of connecting these histories um, through common experiences of imperialism. So, so Lotus was a very important journal and it's part of the, um, you know, part of his personal history. Um, to the left, left is an image from the Afro-Asian Writers Association conference that was held in Luanda, Angola in 1979, the first meeting uh, that was held in Sub-Saharan Africa. This was also the meeting when Laguma became Secretary General, and uh, the picture to the right is, is a picture of him from that period. Um, the, to the left, you could see um, a cover image of the book uh, that will be out hopefully by the end of the year. Um, to the right is a picture of me with uh, Blanche Laguma, uh, Alex's wife, who's still alive. She lives in Cape Town. Uh, she returned to Cape Town during the early 1990s after, after the ban was lifted on ANC and SACP and, and activists. And, and so she returned. And I should say quickly that she's been a crucial person in terms of the republication of these materials. I basically couldn't have pursued these projects without her support. Um, so that's a picture of me and her uh, in her apartment in Cape Town holding a holding the second edition of a Soviet journey that came out in in 2017. Um, I should say quickly too that part of this research has also taken me to Cuba um, twice and to the left actually to the right is an image of the home where Laguma uh, Alex and Blanche lived. Um, effectively, that was the embassy of the African National Congress 
during the late 1970s and 1980s. And so I was able to find that. It's just outside of Havana. Um, the, the, the mother and daughter to the left um, are the neighbors, former neighbors of Alex and, and Blanche. And, and when I found this house, I met them and they remembered Alex and Blanche from, from the 1980s. And, and um, so it was very special to sort of meet these people in Cuba who, who knew Alex personally. So part of my journeys have, have, again, taken me to Havana. And I should say quickly that Alex is still buried in, in Havana, Cuba. Um, he's, again, one of these activists who, who died in exile. He uh, didn't make it back. And there's a real tragedy for, in, in that sense um, that shouldn't be overlooked. So to the left is an image of Alex's grave. And, and to the right is, is the cemetery that that he is, his his grave is located in it's it should be said it's the cemetery Christopher Columbus it's the largest cemetery uh, in Havana there must be you know thousands of people there um, it's 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 uh, it, it's a very honorable place to to be buried there so it's it's uh, it was it was very special to find his his grave in Havana I want to now shift to the research I've been doing I realize I've been um, talking for quite a bit but I just want to play a brief clip of the kind of uh, radio plays that Laguma himself wrote. Um, and I'll talk briefly about the plays and then open up for Q&A. But I just wanted to, again, give a soundbite of, of the kind of radio plays that, that he, was, he was writing um, between October 1966, um, that is to say a month after he went into exile, and then September 1968, so almost a two-year period um, in London. In memory of Mr. Bamboo, the fifth in a series of sketches for radio specially written by Alex Laguma. In memory of Mr. Bamboo. That man again. Come inside. Oh, hello, Sipper. Good morning, Miss Ezra. How are you keeping? Oh, very well, I suppose. You only suppose, Miss Essa? You can't be feeling too good. Oh, it's as well as can be. You sound so forlorn and sickly, Miss Essa. I'm all right. Why is having a radio to listen to when you're lonely? <laughs> Reminds me of the old days, huh? Old days? The old days were, were better days, wasn't it, Miss Essa? Everything was different then. How did Miss Ajaji, Mr. Bamboo's sister, put it there? Something about that, that something, you know. And status and fame. And money, of course. Ah, yes. You know what I mean. At least Mr. Bumble may his spirit rest in peace. In your... Those suits, cream linen suits and straw hats. Ah, yes, Miss Essa. How he looked. When he attended his conferences and receptions, when he came to visit the charcoal club to dance. <laughs> Especially with you, Miss Essa. You've been coming here on and off for a very long time now, Sipper. And always it's the same thing with you, Mr. Bumble. I don't go on much. You're the only one associated with the late Mr. Bumble who I can visit now. After all, Miss Essa, I was his chauffeur for many years, over 10 years. I used to take the two of you driving, remember? Can I forget? Well, those days are gone. Do you know, every Sunday I visit the grave of Mr. Bumble. May soul rest in peace. Except here, yeah, I go nowhere else. Why should I? And I've grown used to you, Sipper, the faithful Sipper. Faithful unto the grave, eh? Mr. Bamboo's grave. You don't remember the times when I... I'm going to stop it here. Um, In memory of oh, Mr. Sorry. Bamboo. Sorry. The fit sorry about that. Um, so just to... Uh, so I hope that gives some sense of the kind of radio dramas that Laguma was writing. And um, it should be said quickly too, that, um, you know, the, the kind of dramas he was writing, and this is something I, again, this is work in progress and something I'm still thinking through, but, you know, the, the dramas that he wrote about were very, um, you know, they're very entertaining. The, what, what I mean by that is, is that um, the political content is, is a bit more removed. 
Um, it's not as uh, strongly emphasized as you might receive in some of his novels that are directly about activists, directly about prison life. Um, the radio dramas he wrote about, there's there are a series of, of um, sort of an informal series of two detectives uh, who are investigating crimes and in township areas, and it's a good cop, bad cop kind of dynamic that's, you know, funny. Um, and then also there's this, this multi-part series called Inside an African Government that uh, basically is a, a series of, of radio dramas dealing with, you know, this sort of uh, anonymous African government and, and sort of the issues it's confronting um, with regards to, you know, economic concerns and, and sort of the, roman the romantic uh, entanglements of certain politicians, but it's all done in a funny way. Um, the upshot is that uh, Laguma wrote 18 radio plays over this two-year period, again from October 66 to, to September 1968, and, and a lot of these pieces are, you know, sort of light entertainment. Um, and for me, that is very interesting insofar that it provides yet another dimension to Laguma's writing life. It, you know, again, he wasn't always this, you know, sort of serious orthodox communist, but, you know, he also had a sense of humor. Uh, and he, you know, was able to write in a very entertaining way. Um, so effectively, my research has been um, transcribing these plays, you know, sort of, you know, getting them down, um, but also, you know, thinking about how these plays fit in with Laguma's uh, uh, broader body of work. And so in the same sense that I've, with the two previous book projects, I've tried to emphasize as nonfiction, um, in this project, I'm trying to emphasize his, his, you know, skills with dialogue, his skills with, um, you know, writing for radio. Um, so along with that, it's also important to note that, that also in the, the ATM archives, there are these seven commentaries slash interviews with um, different African writers, including Masizi Kunene, Eskia Mpulele, a, a South African writer who was a friend of Laguma's, uh, Cyprian Kwenze, um, Dennis Brutus, who is another friend of Laguma's. And then the Nigerian uh, writer Amos Tutuola, who wrote the the Palm Wine Drinker and and My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, the upshot being that that what's interesting about these these monologues and and interviews is that you see African writers or or you see a African writer that is Laguma engaging with other African writers, and it 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 provides a kind of um, you know criticism that's different from the kind of criticism that I think we've become accustomed to. That is to say, um, you know, literary critics, uh, you know, basically academics, um, you know, you know, writing about these, these African writers and, and, you know, these African poets and novelists and so forth. Um, so in this, in this instance, we have writers on writers. And so that's something else I'm trying to think about and develop. Um, you know, what did, you know, Laguma as a South African writer think of, you know, a writer like Amos Tutuola? Um, there are two very different writers. I mean, Tutuola is, you know, from Nigeria. He's, you know, building on local traditions, um, oral traditions in a way that, that Laguma is a very urban writer. Um, you know, he wasn't doing that. So it's an interesting set of dialogues to also um, you know, think about and piece together. Just finally, um, before we open it to q and I should say that, you know, much of this writing was done for the Transcription Center in London. Um, this is where the Dennis Durden collection, um, you know, the, this is the, you know, the heart of the Dennis Durden collection, these, these recordings from the Transcription Center. And it should be said quickly that the Transcription Center was, uh, you know, sort of this the center for a range of African writers. So, you know, Laguma wasn't necessarily unique to, to become connected with the center. Um, in fact, I would say that the most prominent um, or one of the most prominent writers at the center was uh, Louis Nkosi, um, another South African writer um, who also went into exile um, and actually also was a friend of Laguma's. Um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do as well is, you know, sort of piece together the, the center itself. There has been some scholarship on the center already. Um, and, you know, certainly Laguma as a writer 
um, would find, you know, very appealing to hang out with other African writers. So there, there is a obvious logic, but at the same time, I'm very interested in how um, African writers interacted with one another while they were in places like London, um, while they were in exile and so forth. I should say also too that um, the Transcription Center was, <clears throat> excuse me, funded in part by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was uh, basically an arts funding agency that was supported by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, this gets into a longer discussion about how the CIA and the Soviet Union um, funded different um, publications, different arts organizations. I should say quickly, the Soviet Union provided funding for Lotus, which Laguma was involved in. So um, the one reason I bring this up is simply because it's unclear to me at the moment why Laguma stopped writing for uh, the Transcription Center, stopped writing um, radio plays. And I, I think one reason might be that he discovered there was this, this kind of funding for the Transcription Center. Um, but in any case, he, he stopped writing in, in 1968. And my ambition is, you know, to, to put together these radio plays and commentaries into another book project and have that be another side to, to Laguma and thus complete this, this, uh, research puzzle I've created my, created for myself. So, um, I'll stop sharing my, my screen now and, uh, open it up for questions. I hope I hope I didn't go on too long. But uh, I, you know, I also hope as indicated, you know, this is, you know, something I've been working on for quite some time. It's something that's, that's been very organic, in a sense, you know, sort of, you know, starting, starting with Laguma just as a reader and just being, you know, interested in his fiction, and then discovering these different parts of his life. And, and then, you know, gradually pursuing them in that one project leading to another. And uh, so it's, it's personally, it's been very enriching to sort of track the movements of, of this, this writer intellectual activist. And I'm hoping other, other readers and scholars will get to learn about these new dimensions of his life. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Chris. This is fascinating. And it's, great to hear about the project itself and the process and, and the way that one piece has led to another and, and that those are entangled. So we do invite people, um, if anybody has any questions um, or comments, to go ahead and pop those into the Q&A. And while we're waiting for people to have a chance to type, if anybody has any questions, um, I'll just say that I was struck by the fact that you were talking about, your, one of the things you're looking at is his writing for radio, and it occurred to me that because of the materials that you're looking at and, and or actually no, we'll be very specific with the verb, because of the materials you are using um, and the format of them, you are in fact in that part of the research writing from radio because you've been engaged in hours and hours of transcription. And I think um, as a researcher, as a scholar, that's a really interesting thing to do because we process it very differently. If you were reading you know, the, the script of, of the radio play, that would be very different than yes. the way you experienced it, which is already with the characterizations, with the inflections, with the timing. Yeah, it's, you know, you're raising a number of interesting questions that I've grappled with. I mean, as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, hearing Laguma's voice, for example, was really exciting for me. Um, and, you know, at a certain level, it's, I feel like I'm, like removing the magic or, you know, by, by transforming this audio into the printed word and, you know, sort of doing that. I think, um, you know, these plays were written for radio, you should listen to them. Or, you know, these interviews were for radio audience, you know, you should listen to them. So, you know, I, there's, there's a part of me that's a little conflicted about doing that. On the other hand, you know, I think, you know, Books are important, um, you know, and putting these things on paper and having them available is, is um, you know, it is a way of contributing. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, I have been thinking about, the, you know, that issue. I should say quickly, too, that, um, you know, I'm trained as a historian of Africa, and a lot of African history is through oral interviews. There's a sort of a, you know, a a very strong um, 
interest in oral traditions and I see these radio plays. I mean, it's it's not a tradition per se, but it points to the, you know these materials point to the other kinds of oral evidence that are out there, um, and I think that that's also um, another way in which I've approached this material, and and another reason why I think you know transcribing it, you know putting it down on paper, thinking about it that way, um, is also also has value. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so I guess what I'm saying too, in response to your question, that, you know, it, it is unfamiliar to work with radio recordings. On the other hand, it, it also is kind of familiar. It, it, you know, it relates to things I've done before. Um, so, so yeah, thank you. And I think there is something gained. And I think sometimes we don't necessarily know what is going to be gained when we're moving things back and forth from one modality to another, when we yeah. are moving from the printed page into, um, a, a reading, whether it's live or recorded, when we're moving from a recording into a transcription, because there are so many decisions that go into transcribing, even when we're doing it just for our own personal use for yeah. reference later. Um, but you're working on it as part of a larger project that's going to be shared with others. So then there are a whole other layer of decisions that go into that. Yeah, you know, just to build on that briefly too, I mean, something that I've thought a lot about, particularly in relation to the previous two projects as well, or, you know, you know, my responsibility as an editor of somebody else's work and, you know, what are the ethics of that? And with the Soviet journey, which was, which was published as a book, in a sense, it was more easily answered because it was a book of his, you know, I had it transcribed um, I added notes to it and I, you know, sort of explanatory notes as to, you know, who Laguma was referring to, for example, in a particular passage, you know, things of that nature and, you know, sort of doing this with Blanche, his wife. Um, culture, and, culture and Liberation, this book that's coming out, it, it presented yet another challenge because it was an entirely new book that Laguma didn't approve of in his lifetime. So in effect, I was putting together materials that that he may or may not have um, agreed to. And of course, I did this also with Blanche, like I was like, you know, this could be a great project, but I don't want to, you know, misrepresent the legacy of Laguma in some way by, by doing this project. Um, and but, you know, we went forward with it. Um, but even, you know, things like, if I'm transcribing something, and I notice there's an error, like a, gr a grammatical error, you know, do I intervene as the editor and correct it? <laughs> or do I let it stand as, as a historical document that indicates that Laguma made an error? Um, I think about those things a lot. <laughs> like what, what is my, what are the ethics of this? And I mean, of course, I, I, want, I, I want to present Laguma in, in, the strong, in, in the strongest way possible. So, you know, there are moments where I have corrected what clearly seemed to me like grammatical errors. And I do it with the understanding that he might not have had a chance to correct his own writing, that you know, he might have submitted it to a journal, or in the case of these radio recordings, you know, somebody misspoke. And you know, it might not um, and you know, it, it's something that he would have corrected. Um, so anyway, to 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 that that's a very long answer to the question you're raising. But the point being that, you know, part of doing this work is also very much thinking through the tasks of what it means to be an editor. You know, what are the ethics of it? It's not simply transcribing, but it's also, you know, making certain decisions about, you know, what the original author might have wanted or intended. And um, again, I've, you know, I've, I feel like overall I've taken a very conservative approach and, you know, being non-interventionist in terms of correcting his work. Um, but there are times when I feel like, you know, there's an error here and it, it can be, it, it should be corrected. Um, so. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, point. And I'll go ahead and invite Alan. Yeah, great. I'm glad you're back on, Alan. It's going to invite you to come and join us too, because I think a lot of times ethnographers are thinking about that in terms of their interviews. And then here you're thinking about things that are recorded, but it was someone who was writing, who often was able to go back and do corrections and, and go over things, but in, as you pointed out, in some instances wasn't. But Alan, I'd love to hear your thoughts about any of 
these things and then I'll take a look at the Q&A too. Well, I think those are the questions Chris raises are, are great questions and uh, I don't have good answers for him in this particular case. Uh, it is a um, something he ultimately has to decide uh, the right path. And in the mm -hmm. archiving world, we try to, we do our best to preserve the provenance and uh, the, the trace through history of a particular artistic artifact um, and the ways it's been uh, documented, uh, corrected, uncorrected, and what have you. Uh, mm -hmm so that uh, whatever subjectivities were applied to it at a certain point in time, someone else can go back and understand uh, the decisions that were made at a particular point in time and in a different moment in time, decide um, the decision to correct something or to change it uh, uh, was the wrong thing to do. Um, yeah. we, we kind of recently been dealing with a collection uh, made in the 1930s of African-American music uh, where the scholar used uh, the kind of typical dialect speech of that time period to represent African-American speech, which um, all, had all kinds of layers of, of um, negative racist uh, connotations, uh, even though the scholar was working to promote um, the views of African-Americans, but, uh, you know, so our dilemma, dilemma is, in putting this material online, how do we how do we represent both that history as well as uh, we don't want to appear to be putting it forth in dialect speech uh, as a as a way of representing it currently. So um, yeah, these are real dilemmas, and uh, we we make a, try to make the best informed decision we can and let people know what we did and and why we did it. So thinking about putting it online leads to also questions in addition to representation of access. And so I have a question here in the Q&A for access. And I think the first part um, largely is specifically about your project, Chris. But then the second part, I think, has broader implications both for this project and for archives and libraries uh, um, and other collections more generally. So Neroli Price has asked, would you consider publishing these extracts or insights in an audio format in addition to text? This seems like a really important contribution to understanding South African struggle history. Is there a way to make the collection accessible to South Africans beyond university libraries only? So I'll kind of let both of you speak to that a little bit. Chris, if you'll go ahead and. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a great question. I mean, it's something that I, I mean, let, let me say this, the issue of access is something that um, is important to me in you know, even though it's it's important to me, it's it's also something hard to 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 guarantee and facilitate. I think that um, you know when when I work with a publisher, you know, enter with a contract in, into a contract with a publisher, um, you know, of course, I'm I'm doing it with the idea that the publisher will make these materials available to libraries and and beyond. Um, you know that. What, you know, often it does happen, you know, in terms of, you know, getting to libraries, but then of course, um, you know, the question of, you know, how wide an access it can be. I mean, that's another thing. I mean, and I'm not a complete expert on either. I mean, certainly publishers want to protect the material that they publish. If everything was open access, publishers wouldn't make money and they'd collapse. So there has to be some sort of middle ground between you know, publishing and, and, and making things available, but maybe not entirely open access. Um, that's one way of approaching the issue. The other part of the question from what I understand is you know, you know, providing audio content. Um, that's something I've been thinking about. I, you know, and this is something that I probably should have a, you know, a serious conversation with Alan about in terms of you know, you know, how this, about that possibility. I mean, I, I, I certainly, I, I like the idea of having, and I'm just, you know, sort of brainstorming out loud, you know, like a, a book that, you know, has transcriptions of, of the audio material and then having like, um, you know, a CD or something that goes with the book that, you know, it can be listened to as well. Um, I know there must be rights issues with regards to this. So, 
um, you know, that's something to, to that, that can prevent that. Um, but, you know, it's also, you know, another way of, you know, retaining, um, you know, both the original recording, and, you know, making the original recording available to a wide audience, while also, you know, having something transcribed that people can read and, and sort of analyze as a text. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are things I'm thinking about. I, again, the, this is research in progress. And, and so I take, I take to heart the suggestion of, you know, including audio material and, and making it available. That's something I'm sympathetic to. But again, there are issues of rights and, and, and publishers and, and things of that nature. Uh, I'll say that uh, our work here at the Archives of Traditional Music is, is uh, consumed with making materials available online uh, right now. An enormous uh, amount of our collections have been digitized in the last few years. And uh, it's something we work on constantly uh, to prepare those uh, field broadcast and commercial recordings for online access. All of them are, that access is constrained in some cases by uh, legal and ethical issues, copyright, uh, deposit agreements, uh, uh, things that culturally shouldn't be, ma be made uh, available to the world. Uh, so, but beyond those constraints, uh, we, we are constantly working to make as much as we can available online, uh, either to the world or to the IU community or to very s uh, select, uh, say, indigenous communities in some cases. To the particular, uh, to Chris's particular situation, he, if he publishes a book on uh, the radio plays uh, and for materials for which we have recordings, uh, we would be very happy to work in kind of a collaboration to kind of host and make those available online. Um, um, there would be undoubtedly some um, legal issues to work through, but uh, we have in some cases uh, worked to license materials uh, to make them publicly available. And uh, I can point you to a model that we've done with other publications. Uh, something called atmuse.org, A-T-M-U-S-E.org, where we've partnered with authors for a variety of different kinds of publications where they're writing about something uh, where an audio recording is uh, the primary element uh, or uh, video in some cases. And that, um, that short link takes them to a, a page where then they can access that media uh, that goes along with, with their publications. So. That's something we, we've been doing and would be happy uh, to work with Chris if the, that's the route he would like to go. That's great, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here. And, oh, thank you. I see that Allison has popped the ATM um, at Muse website in there. So HTTP at muse.org, that's great. Thank you, Allison. Um, so we have one more question that we will do. And this is, hi, this is Aiden from UWC in Cape Town. I'm interested in this idea of the audio imagination and find it incredibly generative. I'm wondering whether what you are describing as the audio imagination extends beyond the form of radio into other forms of sound and media representation of literariness and invention as you're thinking about it in your work. I'm thinking here of the work of early African intellectuals, composers like John and Nokutela Dube, for example. Thanks for sharing this exciting work. Uh, well, my, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I, I just would say my short answer is yes. I, I think this idea of the audio imagination um, isn't, you know, constricted to radio. Um, it's, I, you know, just to explain it as a, as a concept. I mean, I was, you know, as I've been working through the material and thinking of ways of, you know, framing it, um, and also, you know, coming up with an expression that could, you know, open up these recordings to, to other um, oral sources. And, you know, this is the, the sort of provisional concept I've arrived at. And, um, you know, it, it, it goes hand in hand with, um, you know, his, his, with Laguma's, you know, fiction imagination, his political imagination. Um, so it's just another component of his intellectual life and um, yet also trying to give it a distinctive quality that, 
you know, Laguma was challenging himself by writing for radio. And um, in, in the case of the monologues, you know, you know, you know, performing these monologues himself, you know, writing for radio. Um, and I, I should say, you know, just to add to that quickly, I mean, uh, even though I, I describe these radio dramas as being light entertainment, I don't mean to diminish the hard work involved. I mean, one of the things that comes across to me in, in, in listening to them and, and also listening to his commentaries on other African writers is his, you know, sort of his facility with dialogue, his facility with language. And um, what what I've learned from, you know, working with Laguma across, across these three different projects is just how talented he was. I mean, he was able to, you know, sort of shift gears, um, adjust to situations and um, do so with, do so at a high level. Um, I don't see these, re these radar recordings as, you know, filler or, you know, something that, um, was beneath him or anything like that. I mean, I, I'd see it as just yet another challenge and opportunity that as an artist, as a writer that he, he confronted and took on. So um, again, this idea of the audio imagination for me is a way of thinking through how he, you know, once he went into exile, when he was in London, you know, started this work, you know, how he started to think differently, how he started to write differently, how he knew that if he were to write, you know, radio dramas, that that there had to be a kind of oral quality um, such that you can sort of imagine the situation in your own mind, um, as opposed to reading it on the page and, 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 um, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's again, something I'm still thinking about, but certainly it's a concept that I think could be applied to other, other kinds of um, oral literature. And I would be excited to, to read how other people use the concept. So I'm, I'm open to that for sure. If at some future point you want to convene a discussion all about that, we'd be happy to host that as well. So yeah, that would be exciting. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work. It was exciting to get to hear how you're thinking through these things and, and about the materials that you were able to use from the archives of traditional music. Thank you, Alan, for being with us today and for facilitating this and, and working in a different mode than what we're used to, creating a, the possibility for virtual research, which I think has opened up some new realms. So we greatly appreciate that. Thank you for your time, Chris, and thank you all for being with us. Well, thank you so much to all of you and, and for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about my work. So thank you. It's our pleasure. Thank you all. We hope to see you again at a future event. Take care.